Good Grief. That's the title of a well-known book by a famous pastoral counselor, Granger Westberg. But Good Grief is also something that we're going to be thinking about locally today as it applies to us in this post-Easter season. Stay with us. Austin Faith Dialogue at the crossroads of religion and life a series highlighting the cultural and social interactions between the worshiping and religious communities in and around the capital city. Austin Faith Dialogue is brought to you by the Austin Metropolitan Ministries in cooperation with KXAN. Join us now in Austin Faith Dialogue. Hello, I'm Richard Thompson of Austin Metropolitan Ministries, bidding you welcome to this edition of the show. And today we're reflecting upon the subject of good grief. It's a subject that has been implicit in a number of our programs since uh, Austin Faith Dialogue began airing in 1988. It's also something that's been implicit in the work of our guest today, uh, Chuck Meyer, who is the Vice President of Operations at St. David's Medical Center. We welcome you, Chuck. Thank you. Nice to be here. And uh, you've written several books that have touched on that. Can you just review those with us. Sure have. I have a book called Surviving Death, A Practical Guide to Caring for the Dying and Bereaved, and a book called uh, A Good Death, uh, Challenges, Choices, and Care Options that really deals with more end-of-life care. Mm -hmm. Okay, and both of those uh, picking up on the grief theme in a way that uh, makes me wonder, what is bad grief? That's a good question. Uh, bad grief, I think, often starts with a bad death, and so you can ask what a good death looks like. There was a study done by the uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, about four years ago, five years ago now, uh, where they looked at uh, 10,000 dying Americans. These were people who could talk, who were lucid, who could say what they wanted. And what they found was Americans die uh, alone in intensive care on ventilators, uh, unconscious. If they're conscious, over 50 percent of the patients that they studied spent the last three days of their existence in moderate to severe pain with little attention given to advanced directives and uh, almost no attention to spirituality. Mm -hmm. So out of that, they launched this, what's called Last Acts. Uh, you may come up on the screen, lastacts.org is their website, where they're trying to affect end-of-life care in the United States and thereby affect uh, what grieving looks like. Because if you have a particularly, what you and I might refer to as a bad death, a high death in a hospital, in ICU, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to at home with hospice or here in Austin in Christopher House or with family around or whatever you might want, quick painless at home with family around mm -hmm. are usually the four things. Grief can be very different, uh, I think, depending on that death experience. Okay. So as uh, in terms of people dying in circumstances that are outside their home or outside the care and comfort of family, uh, you, for the family, it impacts them. I mean, they're... Yeah, I think it does. Sort of your, your last view of your last gift that, to that person and their last gift to you can, I think, dramatically affect how you react to that over the next six months to year. Mm -hmm. Well, I, um, I have wondered, too, Chuck, you've been an author. You've been writing about other people's mm -hmm. experiences. Uh, what about your own? How, mm -hmm. how have you experienced a good grief? Well, I think uh, good grief has involved having friends around, people who uh, care about us. Mm -hmm. uh, in Austin, we're really blessed to have a large number of support groups uh, for the love of Christie, hospice, I mean, just to name a couple, uh, that, that work with people who are grieving uh, losses of all kinds. So th I think the most important thing for me was to have friends around and somebody that you can call up and talk to or who check in on you. In the Surviving Death book, I talk about uh, having a 2 a.m. insurance policy, and that means that uh, we'll often give people our business card with a home phone number on the back saying, uh, call me at 2 o'clock in the morning if you wake up mm -hmm. crying your eyes out. Mm -hmm. It's not that people will actually do that, but having that card available can make all the difference in the world, waking up with a card to somebody you could call than waking up with nobody to call. Mm -hmm. So I think having that kind of support around is really, really important to good grief. Now, you've experienced that yourself. Yes. Mm -hmm. In the wake of your wife's death. Right. My uh, first wife died in uh, 82, mm -hmm. uh, very suddenly. And uh, 
it was friends really that came to the rescue and that were there. And uh, plus, I had had uh, 12 years of experience in chaplaincy and kind of watching people move through this. Mm -hmm. um, Although it's different when it's you, as you know as well as I do. All right. Yeah. Well, I've I in I found reading your book Surviving Death very helpful in my own experience, and I I judge that uh, this was growing out of not just academic type reading right. or even your hospital chaplaincy, but your own uh, your own experience. Somewhat. The interesting thing about it is most of that book was written before she died. Oh, really? Yeah, and most people don't know that, but so the book was really. Pretty much together before that, uh, before she died. Mm -hmm. You know, you've uh, you've uh, been helpful to suggest a series of uh, uh, Austin Faith Dialogue subject on yeah. good grief, yeah. and uh, I think folks would be interested to know what might be touched upon if we do that. Well, I think it's pretty exciting as we've talked that this looks like a time when there are people really clamoring for this information about really good end of life care about uh, how to handle their grief uh, in addition to, uh, to handling a good death. There are a number of ways it can be approached, a number of topics that we'll talk about on Austin Faith Dialogue. Uh, everything from uh, uh, funeral planning to uh, maybe looking at grief in particular kinds of illness, which may be different from um, accidental sudden death as opposed to ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, or Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. uh, many diseases in which people experience a kind of uh, uh, little deaths, just a little little death at a time of loss of function or loss of relationship. Um, we can talk about uh, uh, all kinds of issues of end-of-life care. Uh, what does a good death look like? What are people's options? Mm -hmm. uh, talk about everything from hospice to um, uh, home death. And uh, <clears throat> what about talking about things besides death? I mean, <laughs> grief is a, a human reaction that uh, cuts across so many Absolutely. other experiences sure. of life. And I think we need to talk about different uh, spiritual approaches to grieving as well and how some spiritual uh, issues uh, come up that maybe don't come up at other times. Mm -hmm. uh, way to look at that. Uh, a lot of ethical issues regarding not just death and dying, but um, issues that people have to deal with in the grieving process. Well, I uh, <clears throat> have to tell you that I uh, looked at this morning's newspaper, mm. and uh, it was uh, about in the aftermath of uh, the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh -huh. Five years later, the headline was something like, Grief Renewed mm. After Five Years. Mm. And today it was one year after Columbine. And one year after Columbine. Right. And the fact that uh, the process, the corporate grief, uh -huh. goes on. Well, that's... That's something that people don't talk about very often is the whole issue of corporate grief and grieving as a country, uh, grieving as a nation, grieving as a, as a faith community, as a church. Mm -hmm. um, that would be a really interesting topic to get into as well. Yeah. Uh, speaking of grieving for the church, you've written this book called right. uh, uh, Dying, Dying church, church, Living God. God. That's right. But where do, how does grief play into, into your thesis there? Well, there's a whole section in the Dying Church book about grieving the loss of the church as we have known it, um, because it is not only changing, I think it's dying to be resurrected in some totally new form, we hope. Mm -hmm. uh, and we believe. I mean, if you believe uh, in resurrection, then that really, I think, is where God is leading us. But to do that, we have to mourn the death of the institution as we have known it. Uh, and that involves grief just as any other loss. We talked, we've talked about a bunch of losses actually coming down here today talking about loss of jobs uh, that mm -hmm. involves grief, loss of relationships, um, loss of identity, people move from one situation to a another. Uh, people who are amputees have uh, loss and grief issues as well, loss of an organ or a limb. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> and, I, and I, I think your whole idea of, uh, with in going back to the church just for a yeah. moment, that uh, there is, uh, in, in an era of just unprecedented change, change right. and going in the 21st century where uh, all the institutions of our society are yeah. being subject to question, mm -hmm. and the churches or the congregations or the religious institutions of whatever faith right. become uh, uh, questioned, then people are, are, are sorry, are, uh -huh. are sorrowful. Sorrowful, they're sad. But right. once was. Uh huh. 
And something tells me that good grief has to do with moving beyond mm -hmm. just living in a state of, oh, if we could only, you know, uh, relive the past in some way. Yeah. It doesn't mean getting over it, though. We need to talk a little bit more about that in one of the shows, because I don't think you ever get over the death. You may uh, integrate it into who you are, mm -hmm. but in terms of, uh, I hear people saying, well, you need to get over this, or even, even getting beyond it, it, it's a part of who we are forever. Mm -hmm. that, that death and that loss, and that's a part of what grief is about, is coming to terms with that and reintegrating that into the tapestry of our lives. Yeah, I've, I think this is one of the most helpful insights that you've offered. I've heard others say that, as they've read your books, you're, you're saying that um, you continue to feel sure. the pain. Sure. It, it may become less, uh -huh. or you, as it gets integrated into your uh, personality but or it may be 20 years from now on the date of that death yeah. that you have this emotional surge that's almost like the same day and that's just I think that's just normal grieving uh-huh what other thing about corporate grief uh, on the same uh, set of days with uh, Columbine and with uh, Oklahoma City bombing there is the re remembrance of 25 years after Vietnam oh yeah right and uh, there's been some remarks made about bitterness mm -hmm. is still there. Mm -hmm. Hurt is still there. Mm -hmm. uh, there was something that it seems like the country lost mm -hmm. in addition to the 50,000 young men right. and women who were killed. Right. And, um, and with a, a grief that is not addressed in some way. Right. You know, it seems to me that's still an issue for us. Oh, it's still an issue. And the question is, how do you move grief through healing? What would it take to heal that bitterness? Uh -huh. What would it take to heal that grief, and what would the healing look like? Yeah. It raises a good, a good theological question, too, okay. like when uh, the Pope has talked about the sins of the past right. and the mea culpa that has been in the news recently. Can you really um, exercise a grief process mm -hmm. corporately, or is it just individuals mm -hmm. that have to do this? Mm -hmm. um, Oh, I think institutions grieve. I think the church is grieving its own death. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think uh, maybe part of that is what the Pope's alluding to with uh, moving beyond, where, as you have said, where they have been in the past. But I do think there's institutional grieving. Certainly it's corporate grieving. We were talking about this in health care the other day about with all the changes in health care uh, and the Balanced Budget Act and how difficult it is to really put the pennies together. Uh, there's a lot of grief going on for the way things used to be. Yeah. Even in hospitals. Even in hospitals, <laughs> that's right. Who are needing healing. Huh? That's right. We need healing ourselves. We're coming up on time for a break, and uh, I think when we do, uh, as we come back, there will be a little surprise for our folks. That's so, right. So uh, if you folks stay with us, and we'll be right back on this edition of Awesome Faith Dialogue. Welcome back to Austin Faith Dialogue, where today we are in conversation with Chuck Meyer, the Vice President for Operations at uh, St. David's Hospital, on the subject of good grief. might explain that uh, Chuck Meyer is an Episcopal priest, as well as having this administrative job at St. Right. David's Hospital, and that uh, the operations don't have to do with surgery. No. And, uh, and this is a, a new uh, development for us, Chuck, because... As I mentioned in the first, we 
hope to be coming back to this uh, general topic of, of grief in future programs mm -hmm. and have you uh, do some hosting for us. Well, why don't we start now? So uh, maybe you could start by uh, seeing what some of my ideas are on this. I'd like to uh, welcome you to Austin Faith Dialogue, and our guest today <laughs> is Rich Thompson. That is a switch. That is a switch. How's it feel to be in the other chair? Well, it feels good because uh, having been doing this for uh, over 12 years, uh -huh. this is my first opportunity really to uh, comment on a subject that is important to me, as I've maybe even indicated some in the first half. Tell me about the programs that you've had in the past on Austin Faith Dialogue that have dealt with these issues. I mean, yeah. sort of look back. <laughs> well, I, uh, I, I think the first one we did back in 1988 was on job loss. Huh. Uh, Austin's economy had uh, gone into a dive and mm -hmm. was still coming out of the oil bust. And a lot of folks were uh, feeling the effects of that. And so we had, you know, about the counselors that were in town, the church uh -huh. uh, uh, programs that were addressing this for people there were, who were... There were programs in individual congregations? Or right. Did any of the... Uh, Metropolitan Ministries or any of the other groups address this? AMM was just coming into being at that time, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it was mostly um, through individual congregations. I mm -hmm. think St. Matthew's Episcopal mm -hmm. Church was one place. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in, in 89, we did the first of what's been three programs on hospice uh, because of um, that being the service which is most uh, well-known and I think most uh, widespread uh -huh. in its... Uh, uh, dealing with people in, in terms of the last days of life. We also had, in 1989, the first of a couple of programs on the Austin Memorial and Burial Society oh, right. uh -huh. that uh, has the uh, way of getting people to means of disposing of the body without mm -hmm. the usual cost. And uh, They're still very active, too. Yep, mm -hmm. they are. And um, we had one on teen suicide in 1990 the uh, whole issue of uh, the death of a child, mm -hmm. and particularly in that way, uh, grief big time. We had one on cancer and the spirit in mm -hmm. 1991, uh, one particular form of life-threatening disease and how people have access to counseling, both those who are uh, in a terminal condition and those who are, are surviving it. We had one, now this is one you'll like, we had one in 1994 on hair therapy. Don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, daughter, <clears throat> my daughter in particular would like one on hair loss I see. for me. Yeah. She would think that was well, entirely appropriate. You don't, you don't have to tell her we talked about this. <laughs> okay. but, uh, the fact that uh, hair, th hair therapy, uh -huh. I, I, we had some uh, hairstylists on. Makes sense. And the whole theory was, well, you know, the, the people that do people's hair hear more confessions than priests do. I mean, it's uh -huh. what, for whatever psychological reason, people just start opening up and right. they just talk about their bent. grief. Right. And some of these uh, uh, hair folks have had some counseling techniques about you know how to hear people out. Mm -hmm. And if you've lost your hair because of uh, chemotherapy, mm -hmm. it's a loss. It's a uh -huh. grief. It's, that is actually is one of the major losses of chemotherapy and cancer. Uh, hair loss is just in incredible. Uh, uh, experience for people in terms of loss of identity. You right. no longer look like who you were. Well, that was a, it was a very touching show, actually. I'll bet. I'll bet. And um, then we did one uh, toward the end of 1994, the holiday season, on the holiday blues. And the fact that people oftentimes get depressed oh, coming yeah. up on Christmas and oh, yeah. being alone or not having things uh, the way the or society... It is on TV, right. Yeah. 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 You didn't do bartenders along with uh, with uh, hair hairdressers. No, 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 we haven't had bartenders on yet, but okay. who knows? <laughs> who knows? If you're going to do some shows, maybe you can do that. It's the Episcopal view, you know. <laughs> and um, then we've had um, some counselors on who have uh, talked about the whole range of loss, as we touched on earlier, mm -hmm. that uh, you can you can grieve over, um, as you were saying, the loss of. Um, if you move from one mm -hmm. place to the other. Mm -hmm. uh, I know when I moved here in Austin in 1986, and I'd written a book for the community I was in up in a Chicago suburb mm -hmm. called DuPage Roots. And I just had this real deep sense of uh, being rooted in that community. Mm -hmm. When I came here uh, to, to be the pastor of a church and starting all over, I just 
thought, oh my gosh, you know, I've lost my identity in terms mm -hmm. of having been known up there. And, uh, and I think uh, viewers can identify with that in terms sure. of the transitions in their own life. Because Austin's such a transitional community. What, what was useful to you? Do you remember when you moved here? How did you make that transition, deal with that uh, move grief? Well, you know, I mean, you get involved in the community, and uh, I mean, it's 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 really like uh, not. Uh, I, there was another little song that I wrote that I wrote before I came here, and I had a chance to practice it called "Bloom Where You Were Planted." Uh huh. And uh, are you going to break out in song here now? Well, I I will spare okay, you and good. the viewers All that, right. but the uh, the whole idea though of uh, not waiting around. Yeah. At the very same time, and I think if I had to do it over again, uh, I was in some denial about how that, how deep that grief was, and I should have cried mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. I should have mm -hmm. just somehow found a counselor or somebody mm -hmm. that I could have talked to mm -hmm. to say, "Look, this is really tough." And uh, I was able to find eventually the the connections and the sense of being in, in place. Mm -hmm. But uh, I. I came to, I think out of my own experience, that what bad grief means is not to talk to people about it, to hold yeah. it in. Yeah. That, well, I can do all this myself. Tough, tough it out. Yeah. And, um, and then I think the, um, the whole idea of, you know, you want to get busy and all of that, but you also have to give yourself time. And, and I have right. to say that in the wake of my uh, first wife's death, mm -hmm. that um, I, I felt I'd learned my lesson and I let myself um, feel the pain, and I went to a bereavement group that hospice had, mm. and uh, that was uh, very healing mm -hmm. because you could compare your own experience with that of others. Mm -hmm. And what uh, was healing about hearing others' experience? Well, it made you realize, or made me realize, that uh, I was, in some ways, I was ahead of the game. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. And there was one fellow in the group that uh, his wife had died. Oh, two or three years before, and he still hadn't disposed of her clothes. Uh huh. And uh, and I I didn't have that problem, and I I began to realize there's such a thing as getting stuck, mm -hmm. you know, in the past, and and maybe maybe it was okay for him to hold on to those uh -huh. things. Uh -huh. Different people do this different ways. Yeah. Yeah. But I I do have the sense that um, you need to uh, uh, at the same time. You have a constitutional right to feel sorry for yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. Self-pity is a it, it's God given okay. talent. Just, yeah, just <laughs> wallowing is okay. Everybody uh, needs a good wallow now. Yeah. Then. Right. That's right. And uh, yeah. But then you, you realize you don't have to do that anymore. That's, it's not required eternally. And uh, so that was, that was part of it, and it has uh, since enabled me to find uh, someone that I'm very happy with in marriage again. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that... Um, but as you say, it's an ongoing process because you will all suffer loss repeatedly. Yeah, and each loss can be a way to look at old losses again. It's as though they're in some ways, if not connected, there's some relationship between them. Mm -hmm. Did you find that with your wife's death? Did you find earlier losses uh, coming to mind? Yeah, I mean, you feel like, uh, in fact, it can come out in dreams uh -huh. that you feel abandoned. Mm -hmm. And um, and if you pay attention to those dreams, I think they're they're helpful too in well, uh, understanding I mean, what's going on. In a on. sense, it's true. You have been abandoned. The That's person right. died, and and there you are. Um, and one of the shows that we had prior to her demise that was helpful to me, we had uh, the chaplain from hospice on, Janet. Mm -hmm. And she took us through uh, with some video that they had of the last stages of life. Mm. And just to know what had happened was, was important for me so mm -hmm. that uh, when, uh, you know, Margaret began to withdraw, mm -hmm. it was nothing personal. It's mm -hmm. just people just have to work at, their, at the end of their life mm -hmm. in terms of coming to terms with the end. Sounds to me like you were saying, too, with, with grieving that you needed time for activity to be doing things with people, but you also needed some downtime to either journal or get in touch with the grief or just time to cry on your own or right. do whatever you needed to do. So you needed kind of a balance. It is things. a balance, yeah. right. What you find in your, in your professional life, because you you've been in several parishes, 
did you have people coming in for counseling about this? Were there common yeah. themes? Yeah, I've done some interim ministry since uh -huh. uh, that happened, and uh, we had a workshop on uh, creative loss during the Lenten season that uh, enabled people to... What's uh, creative loss? Yeah, creative loss is to let the loss be gain eventually, and to, uh, to, let, and to affirm that the healing is going to happen if you, you know, open yourself to the means that God has given us to, uh -huh. to heal. Uh -huh. um, I had a fellow call me from the church that I served recently, just uh, within the last week or so, who lost his wife last year. I did her service for him and his family and friends. And he says, Rich, um, when do you take off the ring? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I, I just told him about my own experience, that there is a point in time in which you know you're not married. Right. You still feel that way in right. a sense, but then all of a sudden the reality hits you. That's part of the past now. And again, it's different times for different people. It's right. really a, their own time frame. Right. What, what and, and I might say this. It was important for me to tell him that to take off the ring and to put that part of your life in the past is not to lose your love for the person who's Really dying. good point. Yep. That 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 re remains in the heart, mm -hmm. and um, and that uh, it's. It, I think it was uh, the Tuesdays with Maury. Uh -huh. He said, "Death is the end of a life, but not of a relationship." Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Based on your experience and you know, especially your work in congregation, is there anything you can tell people about what congregations might be doing to better serve those who are grieving? Yeah. Well, I think the important thing is in the preaching. You can start with the pulpit because that's the, the uh, place that people are looking for some guidance and, mm -hmm. uh, on a regular basis is to be honest about uh, the loss and the pain and not to deny it. Not to try to gloss it over or patch it up with religious yeah. stuff. On, on this, sub, this Sunday after Easter, yeah. it may be a good time. Uh, Which that is a hard time for people. Yeah, I mean, their person died and was not resurrected then back on Sunday. Yeah. So lots of mixed emotions about Easter and resurrection. Yeah, and that, and that Easter does not preclude or cut off the grief work. I agree, right. And that it enables you to do grief work with hope and uh, with uh, this, uh, a trust that uh, there is a way through the valley of the shadow of death for you as well as for the one who has uh, preceded you. Well, thanks very much for being our guest on Austin Faith Dialogue today. <laughs> and let me turn it back to you. Well, thank you, Chuck, for uh, indulging me in this, uh, <laughs> uh, this exercise of, of being able to talk a little more than I usually do. Thank you. And uh, we will look forward to uh, weeks ahead when maybe even on a monthly or an ongoing mm -hmm. basis we can touch one another of these subjects. And we'd be glad to have, uh, have you folks let us know as you have thoughts about this. Uh, through Austin Metropolitan Ministries. In the meantime, I'd like to thank Chuck Meyer from St. David's Hospital. And uh, for you, for watching, I'm Richard Thompson. On behalf of Austin Metropolitan Ministries, bidding you good day. <laughs>